Isaiah writes in our Old Testament reading, our first reading today, the very the end of it, the conclusion. God is speaking, and he is talking about his house, God's house, the temple in Jerusalem. And Isaiah is giving us a prophecy of the future. God says, my house shall be a house of prayer for all peoples. This is foreseeing an expansion of the people of God, like an expanding circle from one small nation of Israel towards the whole world. That my house in Jerusalem, in Israel, shall be a house of prayer for all peoples, all nations. This is part of what Jesus is announcing when he announces the kingdom of God. God's work in the world has an expanding nature. He talked about a mustard seed that was a very small thing, but then ultimately is everything. It becomes a great tree, a great bush in which all the birds can have nests. Abraham's family was the beginning of God's people, just one little family. And he was promised that your descendants will be as many as the sands on the seashore and as the stars of heaven. And Abraham's family, his grandson, Jacob, was renamed Israel. And he had 12 12 sons who became the 12 tribes of Israel. When we get to the end of the gospel that we read today, the end of the gospel of Matthew, it concludes with Jesus giving this great commission to his disciples. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, all peoples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, one thing that we see repeatedly in the New Testament, both in our gospel and in our epistle today, was that this idea was difficult for the first Christians. For the early church, it was very hard for them to make this shift in their imagination from seeing God's people as being just the people of Israel to seeing God's people as expanding to include as many nations as would come to Jesus. Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah of Israel, the son of David, is to be the Lord, the Savior of the world, and not just one nation, that through Christ, all people can become God's people. And this is the background, I think, for us to understand our odd gospel reading today. Jesus and his disciples are doing something that's a bit unusual. They are outside of Israel. They're outside of the, out of Galilee or Judea. They are in uh, uh, up northwest of Galilee, close to the Mediterranean Sea. These two big cities by the sea, Tyre and Sidon. So they are in Gentile territory. And we imagine Jesus walking with the disciples. And there is this, as we're told, a Canaanite woman crying out at him. At first, we're told he doesn't respond, and then he says he was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel and not to the Gentiles. But she persists. She says she'd be happy to, with whatever help she can get. If not as a child of the family, then at least as a faithful hound. Even the crumbs that fall from the table. And Jesus says, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter is healed instantly. Now, this is an odd interaction. 
And one of the things that, that I think helps is to remember that Jesus is often indirect in his teaching. Sometimes he just says what's on his mind, but sometimes, in fact, many times, he leads the people around him, the people he's talking with, or the other people who are hearing him talk with other people in an indirect way. He uses parables, he uses leading questions, sometimes even kind of trick questions. He's Socratic in his teaching method, not just saying something, but letting his hearers take an active part in understanding. He often says, for those with ears to hear, let them hear, meaning it's not, may, it might not be as direct as you think it is. So we should see that Jesus is teaching not just in this interaction with the Canaanite woman. He's not just interacting with the Canaanite woman. He's interacting and teaching his disciples and also us, his disciples, his readers in a way where he's leading them from where they are to a better place, a better perspective. So Jesus kind of plays hard to get in this situation. He's playing up the tension, the tension between, you know, he's in, they're in a Gentile territory and he's bringing up, playing up this disparity between the Jews and the non-Jews, the Gentiles making very explicit, very clear his point that the kingdom of God is expanding beyond this division, beyond racial identity with the Jews. If we look earlier in the Gospel of Matthew, this is not a new idea for Jesus. Jesus already did something very similar with the centurion, the officer in the Roman army, and his servant. And Jesus in Matthew's gospel is, is kind of building on this point, becoming more and more explicit, stronger. And here, Matthew, to kind of play up the point, explicitly calls this woman that he that is, is uh, trying to get Jesus to do something, not just a Gentile, but a Canaanite. A Canaanite, that's the name of Israel's ancient enemies, right? Those are the people they were at war with throughout the Old Testament. So this is the enemy of Israel he's identifying her as. But then he plays up this tension, and then it just turns on a dime. And it's like he's kind of turning to his disciples and saying, this is the great faith that I'm talking about. This is exactly what I'm talking about. It's like he was thinking the way they thought the whole time. It's like, no, you're not a part of the family. You're not even... And, the, and, and she's saying, I'm not in this for status or prestige. I just need help. And he, she is trusting in Jesus as the one that will give her the help. And he says, this is the faith that I'm talking about. This is the faith that brings us all into the kingdom. For often our human disobedience, our not coming to Jesus in faith, our pride, our wanting prestige, disrails our approach to God. But we should see that what God is up to is even bigger than our disobedience. That's what Paul is saying in the book of Romans in our reading today, that even human disobedience does not de derail God's ultimate purposes for humanity. God has used human disobedience to further his end. He's used the disobedience of Israel. Israel is not a perfect people. My goodness, read the Old Testament. It's just like a, over and over again, a, a comedy of errors, tragic errors. But that God uses even human sin and rebellion as an instrument of his grace. That God's judgment, that his saying that this is wrong, this is disobedience, this is failure, is taken up in his mercy. 
that Israel's story is fulfilled in Christ. As Paul writes at the end mysteriously, he says, for God has imprisoned all in disobedience. So they could just punish them and reject them? No. So that he may be merciful to all. Our life with God is both a life under judgment. We come needing mercy. We do not have what we need. We need to turn away from our sin, from our disobedience. But it is also a life of grace, of mercy, of new life. Is a life of the cross and of the resurrection. This is something that we live into in our baptism. What makes us Christian is our baptism. This is our initiation that, that replaced circumcision as a Jewish identification. That's why at the end of Matthew's gospel, he says, Go therefore, tells his disciples, Go out, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And it is in this way that God fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah, that God gathers the outcasts of Israel. He gathers others even to them besides those who have already been gathered. He says, foreigners will join themselves to the Lord and be his servants. They will come and they will worship joyfully in the temple. For God says, my house shall be a house of prayer for all peoples. Amen.